some are some maybe not even aware of it. Um, and then I have two use cases that I would like to go over, uh, Volvo and Daimler AGA. Um, and I selected those specifically because they have content related to like um, Internet of Things. And then finally, I'll talk a little bit about Disruptive Technologies Lab and some of the things that we're doing at UWM. So let's have a couple quotes here. Um, here's the CEO of Google. Machine learning is a core transformative way by which we are rethinking um, everything that we're doing. Let's take a look at uh, the CEO of Microsoft, a proud UWM alumni. Artificial intelligence is the defining technology of our time. It's going to be AI at the edge, AI in the cloud, AI as a part of SAP applications, AI as a part of, in fact, uh, even infrastructure. So let's start out with um, a question that I get on occasion. Will robots uh, take my job? And I want to rephrase this question a little bit differently because if you take a look at through history, not so much um, AI, but technology and more specifically automation has changed how we've done things. So uh, years ago, there used to be telephone operators. We don't have them anymore. Um, there used to be bowling pin setters. We don't have them anymore. Uh, we used to have people that would cut ice and deliver to your house. We don't have them anymore. So the question that I want you to think about as I go through my presentation isn't uh, as much about will robots take my job, but how will the technology and how will the automation change what we do? And the reality is, is that um, at least from the research that I've seen, uh, upwards of 40% of uh, jobs over the next five or 10 years will be modified because of this. But what ends up happening is in, in every technology revolution is that some of those jobs, yes, are in fact eliminated, but new jobs um, come to the forefront. And that's what we have to be thinking about from our perspective as a, uh, as a university. And we'll talk a little bit about uh, more of this as I get into the presentation. Um, so here's a couple headlines. We're gonna talk about the hype cycle kind of related to AI. Um, here's a Wall Street Journal uh, headline that says, every company wants to become a tech company even if it kills them. Um, here's a Forbes headline that says, on your marks, business leaders prepare for the arms race and in artificial intelligence. If I was an executive or if I was a C-level person, you know, they're, they're seeing this wave of change that's coming in and starting to be concerned with it. But what you have to do is identify where we are with respect to some of these technologies. Um, if you're not familiar with it, uh, Garner produces um, every single year what's called the hype cycle of emerging technologies. Um, this is going back a couple of years, but I think it gives a snapshot of some of the ones that we're going to talk about today. Um, as an example, on the spectrum, we have augmented reality and blockchain and IoT platforms and virtual assistants. And we go through this phase where there's um, you know, innovation triggers, there's the um, peak of inflated expectations. You see them on all the um, magazines like Wired and stuff like that. Then we have the trough of disillusion where those technologies don't deliver on what they had promised. Um, and then we kind of go through the slope of enlightenment and finally the plateau of productivity. So if we take a look at uh, some of the technologies that are highlighted, and what's interesting, this is already again two years old. This is 2018. So general AI is more than 10 years out. And we'll talk a little bit more about that uh, later on. I'm going to spe uh, specifically in my presentation reference uh, narrow AI, very specific applications. Um, level four self-driving autonomous vehicles are still on a mass scale probably 10 years out. Um, conversational AI platforms, five to 10 years. IoT platforms, depending on what you're looking at, might be at five to 10 years. And now we're getting into a shorter range here. So um, virtual assistants, two to five years. So if this is already two years old, I already have an Alexa device on my phone. I have an Alexa device in my kitchen. I have a Google Assistant in my kitchen. My students at UWM uh, develop voice applications for these. So some of these technologies are now coming to fruition. Uh, deep learning uh, neural networks, which is kind of the the root of um, machine learning is two to five years out. So even though there's hype associated with a lot of these technologies, in the next uh, five or so years, um, they're going to be things that we're going to be using in our factories. They're going to be things that we're going to be using in our phone and in our homes and stuff like that. So we just need to be aware of them and kind of where they sit on this um, spectrum. So let me give you an example of that. I pulled this out because I think it's very interesting. Um, here's a headline that says, we're very close to a peak for fintech. There are more than 10,000 startups trying to jump on this particular boom. So fintech is sometimes associated with artificial intelligence. Um, and what's interesting about it is I think this time, 
regardless of what's happening with COVID-19, which I think is an anomaly, a black swan event, is that we are at a very transformative time, almost analogous to what kind of happened with the web many years ago. There was Amazon.com and then there was Pets.com. Um, one of those is very successful today. In fact, delivers a lot of products and goods that we need on a daily basis. And one of them was unsuccessful. Um, and then we also went through another technology change where we got uh, the mobile device that we have in our pocket and to lesser extent, um, you know, social media, which is our mechanism for how we communicate right now. I think we are in a very similar um, circumstance with some of these technologies now for artificial intelligence, blockchain, and IoT. So the reason I included this slide is because in five or 10 years, there's not going to be 10,000 of these startups, okay? Um, some of them will be very successful like in amazon.com. Um, some of them will frankly just not have business models that don't work and they will be like pets.com. Um, but some of them will be like Uber or, you know, whatever successful mobile platform that there is. And as a consequence, a significant amount of economic activity and wealth and opportunity for us will be created. And the products and services that we expect on a daily basis will basically be enhanced. So um, I wish I could say that I have a crystal ball and tell you which are going to be the winners and losers. But there's going to be this wave. There's going to be this wave and it's going to make our lives um, better because, because of it. And there's going to be a significant economic boom, I think, um, out of these activities. Um, so let's start with a couple definitions. Uh, what is artificial intelligence? I'm going to try and keep this very simple. Um, AI is a simulation of human intelligence processed by machines, especially computers. The process includes learning and reasoning, okay? This is the definition that I'm going to kind of drive home. Even a simpler way to say it, it's a program that can sense, reason, act, and adapt. The difference between AI today and just a basic computer program is that we are not creating an if-else statement. This is something that can learn on its own, and we'll talk a little bit about that when we get to the machining, uh, machine learning aspect. It's something that we can feed experiences. It's something that we can feed data. It's something that we can feed images or voice, and then it can learn from those uh, particular uh, circumstances. Um, if you're not comfortable with that definition, I wanna talk a little bit about some of the characteristics of AI. And I want you to think about autonomy, the ability to perform tasks in a complex environment without constant guidance by a user. Again, this is not a program where we're saying, if this happens, do this experience, or if that else happens, do this experience. This um, can essentially operate on its own and self-driving vehicles are certainly in one of those areas. And then um, adaptivity is another uh, um, characteristic that I want you to think about. It's the ability to improve performance by learning through experiences. Um, that can be feeding it data, that can be feeding it images of cancerous cells and benign cells, and then being able to determine um, you know, treatment for a particular patient. So these are the characteristics that we have of traditional AI today. So let's take a look at the uh, taxonomy of, of AI. I don't think I said that right, but um, in a bigger picture, you have computer science, or I'm from the school of um, information studies. So we have this big sphere right here. Inside of there lives uh, what I would call essentially AI. Inside of AI, we have the concept of machine learning. Inside the concept of machine learning, we have deep learning, which is um, kind of the core technology be behind what's happening with uh, self-driving vehicles. And we'll, we'll talk a little bit about some tangible examples of these, but I also want to highlight another sphere that we have in here. So we have data science. In a little bit, we'll talk about what's the difference between big data and machine learning and how they are kind of correlated together. If you have data and you're doing linear regression on that data, you're in the data science camp. If you're starting to add in um, machine learning algorithms and deep learning, you're in that middle spot right there. And that's a sweet spot where we're taking knowledge of uh, machine learning and deep learning and artificial intelligence and applying it to all the data basically that I have. And we'll talk a little bit about that more. So you can be on the data science side and have nothing to do with artificial intelligence or machine learning. Or you can be in that middle spot and capitalizing on these uh, you know, two pieces basically coming together. Um, so what is the definition of machine learning? Machine learning is an application of artificial intelligence, again, that provides systems the ability to automatically learn, that's the key, 
and improve from experiences without being explicitly programmed. OK, again, we don't have to have if else statements in order to be able to determine that out and not to get uh, too immensely technical about it, but I want to talk about kind of the three areas underneath the umbrella of machine learning. The first one is going to be supervised learning, and what I want you to think at a very basic level associated with this is that if we know the classification of something, this falls under the um, supervised learning aspect. So we can create a machine learning algorithm and we can have some training data and we can have pictures of dogs and we can have pictures of cats and we can feed that. And now we have um, test data and that algorithm should be able to tell us if that's a picture of a dog or a picture of a cat. Now um, that's not very practical, but what would be some applications that could be developed in this particular area? Fraud detection, uh, email spam, image classification, customer retention, um, diagnosis. Again, we could feed images of uh, tumors and benign tumors and then have the um, algorithm determine if it's cancerous or not. Forecasting, predicting, you know, insight. So if we have classifications of those characteristics, we can create uh, machine learning algorithms that provide us. We go over to the other side, unsupervised learning. Let's just say we don't know what the classification is, but we can cluster things together. Um, and an example would be is um, I'm a Netflix watcher and I really like the new Tiger King um, series or I'm a Netflix watcher and I really like documentaries. So we're clustering my preferences and preferences of people similar to me in order to be able to put together um, content recommendation systems. So let's just say I watch a lot of documentaries. I log into my Netflix account and it says, here's another new fantastic um, documentary that you might uh, want to like. So we're clustering items together. We're trying to gain insight from the data that we have. So this can be um, in terms of application, customer segmentation, target marketing, content recommendation systems. And then we also have some other ones um, in terms of big data visualization. Again, we're trying to underline the structure of the information that are inside of there. So if we know the classification, we're in supervised learning. We know that there's some correlation or clustering of the data. We might be on the unsupervised side. Um, and then the third area is basically reinforced learning. Um, and this is real time decision making. So a classic case of this, and we're going to see this later on in the slide deck, is something that's going to be used in self-driving autonomous vehicles. It's taking a lot of information in um, in terms of uh, signage and obstacles in the road, and it has to make decisions. So here we're also learning tasks. We're doing skill acquisitions. And this would be something that you would use potentially on the manufacturing floor in terms of uh, robot navigation. So it has to make real time decisions um, in those particular circumstances. And then there's algorithms and um, research behind each one of those. Um, so let's talk about the difference between machine learning and big data. You've probably heard this terminology um, basically before. And I, I love this comment from Scott Page from the University of Michigan. He says, Companies are increasingly trying to harness the rolling hairball of data that they collect on a daily basis. I'm sure if any of you are living on a manufacturing floor, you're collecting statistical data on quality control, you're uh, uh, collecting inventory levels, and you're trying uh, to store all of this. Um, I want you to think about there is a difference between a lot of data and big data. And what I mean by that is, um, the second definition is that machine learning um, at the root of it is in statistics. And what we want to be able to do is extract knowledge from our data. We might have streams and streams of data. We might have a lot of data, but big data really refers to being able to gain some knowledge or insight from what's happening on our factory floor um, and then being able to use some of that. So I, I could have a totally separate presentation about having to clean our data, having to correlate our data, and um, you know, use it in an effective way. So companies are, are struggling with this. I'm sure uh, everybody's collecting massive amounts of data um, for a whole variety of things, and we'll see some of those in, in use cases right now. But the Matt, key point, go ahead. Matt, hey, we have a question uh, sure. from one of our attendees. So uh, what progress has been made in regards to training and putting these concepts in the local work setting? progress has been made. Um, I guess the way that I would answer it is that um, 
large tech companies like Google and Microsoft and Amazon are working behind the scenes in order to be able to put um, essentially turnkey tools in place so that um, you can take the data that you have, clean it, and then gain knowledge uh, from that. So I, I think it's a, it's a struggle. It's a struggle that every organization basically has to go through. But um, underneath the surface, a lot of these tech companies are trying to um, create systems so that you have the data, you can use their platforms, and then um, gain, uh, gain knowledge out of it. Uh, I'm not sure if that answers the question or not. Sounds good, all right, go ahead. Okay, thank you, Charles. Okay, uh, a little bit. So how can businesses basically use AI? Well, it's going to change the way that we un understand and interact in our customers. We're going to see that in the use case that we have. We're going to uh, offer more intelligent products and services. We're going to see that in content recommendation systems. And then we're going to improve and automate um, business processes. We'll see that in the, uh, the, the Daimler use case basically that we have. Um, so this is what I want you to think about. What is the power of AI in businesses? So again, you know, I started my presentation uh, kind of tongue in cheek talking about will robots displace all of our workers? Um, and some work will change, some work will actually change. But rather than being concerned about all the work basically being displaced, what I want you to think about is AI as a powerful set of tools that will improve decision making, operational processes, aspects of customer service, and more importantly, enabling employees to focus on duties of higher uh, significant value. That's the key that I want you to take away. When you implement these solutions, you're going to be able to create higher value for your organization and then higher value for your particular customers. So let's take a look at that. And what I want you to think about is a successful implementation of AI in an organization requires two things. What do humans do very well? Well, we have some strengths. We have creativity, we have improvisation, we have dexterity, we have judgment, we have uh, social and leadership abilities. Now we want to marry that with what machines do very well, speed, accuracy, predictive capability, and scalability. When you bring those two together in an AI solution, what you're able to do is increase um, humans' ability to have output. We're, we're taking what we do incredibly well, what machines do incredibly well, and we're combining those together so that we can have uh, higher yields of the um, outcomes basically that we have. So when I would work towards uh, successful AI implementations is I would want to capitalize on, on these particular items. So let's take a look at a couple uh, common applications that we're probably already familiar with. Uh, Self-driving cars is going to be a uh, situation. We're going to see a use case um, on Volvo related to this. It's a combination of a lot of different AI techniques, right? There's going to be searching and planning. We have to go from A and B. There has to be computer vision in that circumstance to read the road signs, to read obstacles in the um, circumstance. There might have to be reinforced deep learning in order to do decision making about a ball that bounces in the road. There's rain, there's snow. And what's interesting in this is that all of these pieces have to work flawlessly together in order to be able to avoid accidents. And what we're going to see in the Volvo case is that they are collecting a massive amount of data in order to have more robust and refined systems. Um, and this transcends to a lot of different uh, other environments. So um, autonomous systems can be from delivery robots to flying drones to autonomous ships. Um, so through Silicon Pastures, we just saw um, uh, Angel Pitch related to a flying drone company out of Illinois. Um, that has some proprietary technology and I think will um, be very successful in the future here. Uh, let's take a look at another uh, circumstance. How about content recommendation systems? So on a daily basis, most of the content that we uh, interact with is personalized for us. Um, our Facebook, our Twitter, our Instagram feeds, our online advertising, music recommendations from Spotify, um, uh, movie recommendations from Netflix and HBO are personalized. Maybe you're aware of it or maybe you're not, but every time you Google something that is personalized to your situation, they're looking at um, your demographics and your past searches, unless you um, are in cognito mode, they're looking at your location and they're offering up a unique um, search result for you. On the positive side, that's important. So 
Um, on Fridays, I Google uh, great fish fries near me and it brings up uh, Lakefront Brewery. So this is important. Um, so the algorithms behind the scene that are determining that content either through my Netflix um, or through my Google search are basically based on those um, AI applications. Let's take a look at one more. Um, how about image and video processing? So facial recognition is already a commodity that's used in many businesses and government applications. This can include organizing your photos. I can go into my iPhone and I can search for pictures of myself or my son. If you've ever posted a, a picture out on Facebook, there's auto tagging on social media. Um, there's passport control. I'm a part of global entry that allows me to seamlessly go through um, customs. So a lot of these applications are already in place. Um, but I want you to what I want you to think about is it's not just um, on the social media and image recognition side. It can be used uh, in autonomous vehicles to recognize other cars. And there's again going to be a whole slew of applications that are going to be built in this area. Uh, an example of it is wildlife uh, population estimates. So we can take a snapshot, identify deer population in Wisconsin, and as a consequence, have policies on whether we want to extend deer hunting season or uh, you know, whatever appropriate decision in, in that circumstance. Um, AI can also be used uh, to generate and also um, alter content. Um, this is very popular now um, on the gaming side. So think about all the video games that require all the images and all the media and all the assets that are inside of there. Um, there's generative adversarial networks that can generate a lot of this stuff um, and can streamline the development of uh, basically some of those games. Um, I'm not going to talk a lot about the, the negative consequences. There's some ethical issues that we have to deal with um, related to AI. Um, whether you like Big Brother or not, um, the DHS, um, this is already a year old now, uh, basically says that we're going to have facial recognition in 97% of departing airports um, in the next four years. If you look over to China, they actually are, I think, ahead of the curve on this. Um, individuals over there can purchase food from their uh, facial recognition. Um, they have some public shaming of people jaywalking over there. There's a classic use case associated with that. Um, so whether you like it or not, um, facial recognition is going to be a part of our uh, our daily lives, probably at least on the travel front over the next couple of years. Um, so let's take a look at um, AI and manufacturing. And I want to highlight four areas before I go into the, the use cases that I have. Um, let's think about quality checks. So factories are creating uh, intricate parts like microchips and circuit boards, and they're making use of machine learning, uh, which equips uh, AI with incredibly high resolution cameras. cameras. Uh, and the technology is able to uh, pick out my minute details and defect, uh, detect defects much more reliable um, than the human eye. Um, kind of an analogous uh, associated with this, Domino's Pizza takes a picture of every pizza that comes out of their oven. I obviously, they're not an industrial manufacturer, but they're doing that for quality. And they trace all of those images. If you get a pizza from Domino's and are unhappy with that, they will trace it back to the image that they took of that. So again, they're collecting all of this particular data, which I think is interesting. So quality is on the manufacturing floor is going to be enhanced with um, machine vision. What about maintenance? So smart factories using machine learning to detect and predict uh, defects in machining before uh, any issue arise. This allows for predictive maintenance and can cut down in unexpected um, uh, delays in those circumstances. You're monitoring temperature. You're monitoring uh, the amount of time that your machine is, is running. And then you can, even in an unsupervised fashion, look for trends or um, categories and then identify if issues are occurring in terms of um, your uh, factory equipment. Two more areas that let's take a look at. How about faster, more reliable designs? Um, AI is being used uh, by companies like Airbus to create thousands of component designs in the time that it takes to just have a, enter a few numbers in the computers. Um, Autodesk, which I think is a partner in the um, Connected System Institute, can do what is called generative designs. And it can massively reduce the amount of time it takes to look at designs and then manufacture and test those new ideas. In a little bit, we'll talk about Daimler, which is using obviously 3D printing in order to create components and things like that. So um, 
both through uh, iterations um, and then generative designs, we're going to get much more uh, robust designs for the products basically that we have. Um, and then last one that might be uh, very interesting to uh, individuals in the manufacturing sector, there's advanced manufacturing. There's a company called Preferred Networks, it's out of Japan. And they developed a robotic arm with a camera and machine learning software that given a picture of a successful outcome in trial and error, can figure out a solution associated with that. Again, remember at the, at the core of machine learning, we can feed it experiences or we can feed it data or we can feed it images, um, and then it can learn and develop uh, from those circumstances. Um, so this is actually pretty exciting. So let's take a look at uh, two specific use cases in, in this area. I'm sure everybody's familiar with uh, Volvo. Um, this is out of a book that I have uh, called uh, 50 Successful Use Cases in uh, Artificial Intelligence. Um, and really, uh, they're using machine learning to build much more um, intelligent cars. Uh, a little bit about the background. So they're a Swedish established company, and they're really known for their safety record. That's going to be the key piece as we look at this um, use case. And just like any automotive manufacturer, they're planning on launching four autonomous cars into the market by 2021. Now, if you go back and you take a look at the, the Garner hype cycle that we uh, took a look at, it said that uh, level four uh, self-driving autonomous vehicles, which means that the car has complete control, but you have a driver in that, is still quite a few years out. But what they're trying to do is assess the safety level uh, connected with autonomous vehicles. And they're doing that by collecting a significant amount of data and then analyzing that. So let's take a look at that. Um, so what is the problem that artificial intelligence is trying to solve in terms of Volvo? So Volvo is looking to keep their reputation as a world leader in safety, which is important moving forward with self-driving autonomous vehicles, right? So they care not only about their reputation, about their past, um, but they wanna be known as the most safe self-driving autonomous vehicle on the road. So they're leveraging what they're good at, um, and then what the trends are, are that are coming down the pipeline. So let's take a look at how they're doing that. Um, so machine learning um, driven analytics are collected across a large data set gathered by connected vehicles. Note the word connected, um, and that's one of the reasons why I um, selected this use case. So they have uh, vehicles out there and they're collecting information um, about safety related to them. So they're monitoring the use of applications and the features to understand which functions the drivers find useful, which are underutilized, and basically which ones are ignored. Furthermore, they're looking at early warning systems, analyzing millions of events every week to work out how they are related to breakdowns, accidents, failure rates of those particular vehicles. So this data then helps them understand how vehicles and drivers react to hazardous conditions. So you can probably already get a sense of what they're going to do with this. They're, they're using this to build their self-driving autonomous models, right? If they know how drivers use this, if they know what the accidents and the failure rates are and the breakdowns, they can start to build uh, models associated with this. So the data that's collected from the sensors, again, connected systems, um, the cars in this particular uh, associated are, are uploaded to uh, Volvo Cloud and shared with the Swedish um, highway authorities. So as we build not only the cars, but the infrastructure and the regulation necessary in order to have self-driving uh, vehicles, it's going to be important that those two things have to happen in concert. Um, they also have data analytics that are being carried out with a partnership with uh, Teradata. They are also partnering with NVIDIA and all live in order to create a software uh, group that focuses on building um, safe autonomous driving vehicles that can include um, using deep learning to learn how to recognize and react to objects in the car via the cameras and the sensors. OK, this is going to be our inputs that we're going to use and then they're going to gather that data and they're going to create a situation map or a 360 view of um, that particular car. So they're sharing that with the highway authorities and then they're building the safest model possible for their autonomous vehicles um, in their cars. Uh, so what are the results? So uh, Volvo's uh, data analytics shows them how quickly and accurately to understand faults and errors that can occur with their connected system uh, cars. Um, service centers, what's very interesting, I talked about the power of AI in terms of how we're going to change products and services for our customer. Service centers can better anticipate the tasks that they will face 
and adjust inventories um, accordingly. I, if they're collecting data in terms of failure rates of components or something like that, they can easily send um, a correspondence to their service center to stock up on whatever that particular component is. Um, and then finally, uh, Volvo is starting to launch autonomous vehicles. Uh, the Drive Me trial in Sweden, it's announced in China and then parts of um, the US as well. So uh, one more slide here before going to the next use case. Uh, what are the key challenges, learning ports or takeaway that we have? Um, vehicles are becoming more autonomous before we have complete self-driving uh, vehicles, which is going to be the norm. So safety is going to be the key, right? Safety is going to be the key. If properly trained, this is Volvo's approach, they can dramatically reduce the amount of accidents basically caused by human error. So in a theoretical world, we should have a safer environment when we're driving. And they're doing this, again, by using their cars as their IoT in order to be able to collect that data and then build uh, AI models in order to have the safest vehicles on the road. Uh, let's take another use case here. Um, this is a Daimler AG, uh, former Daimler Chrysler, and they're really known for luxury personal cars. And in this use case, we're gonna take a little different tack. They're working on self-driving autonomous vehicles as well. Uh, but in this uh, case, I wanna highlight some of the things that they're doing in terms of being able to deliver that car um, to the end user. So again, they're the parent company, parent company of uh, Mercedes-Benz. They've long been known for luxury vehicles and they're using machine learning to help uh, streamline processes and cut down costs by re uh, removing um, human errors and all the different equations basically that they have in their circumstance. Um, so what is the problem that they're trying to specifically solve? Actually, the use case out of the book uh, references a couple different cases, but I wanted to, to pull it down specifically to the vehicle production because I think this part is probably the most interesting. So Mercedes is using artificial intelligence to create efficiencies in their vehicle production. Um, if I was on a manufacturing floor, who doesn't want to um, gain efficiencies? So vehicle design and manufacturing that we all know is labor intensive, it's a costly process, high tech plants and equipment um, are expensive and requires a larger workforce. And the flip side of that is equipment breakdowns and human errors can lead to waste of resources, delays, and even potential injuries of um, their particular workforce. So this is the problem that they're trying to solve. Um, so how are they using this in practice? So they're extending their automation to design, production, and the sale of the vehicle. This is a little bit different than the Volvo use case. So they're using cameras, sensors, in and out of things that should sound familiar technologies to give the business real-time overview of their stock inventories and operation efficiencies of their machinery. Again, they want to do predictive maintenance. They want to know what they have in terms of their inventories. They want to know how their machines are basically um, interacting. Again, they're collecting a lot of data in that circumstance. Um, so interesting, uh, prior to this, I didn't even know this. Uh, so each vehicle um, can be built to customer specifications while remaining in a production, a mass production environment. I think that's pretty impressive. Um, so in a previous life, I worked at Harley Davidson and they were trying to do um, custom uh, built motorcycles, but there are only certain variants of that. Uh, Mercedes has kind of perfected that. So you can build a custom Mercedes in a mass production environment. And what's kind of slick about it is they have the Mercedes Me app that allows the buyers to be able to track that progress um, through the vehicle built. So you can create whatever Mercedes you want in a mass production environment, they can custom build that for you. And through the power of your smartphone, you can basically see where that build process is um, happening right now. That is, that's real customer service. That's real customer service in that circumstance. Uh, so what are the technologies, tools, and data sets that are being used in that circumstance? Um, again, this use case focuses more on the production environment, data is gathered through cameras and sensors the very things that we're going to be doing research at the Connected Systems um, Institute about that are connected to machines as well as data from their um, computerized uh, stock inventory systems and then basically customer feedback. So they're using all of this to make better informed decisions about um, the products that they offer, or the production floor that they have, the machinery that they're using, and then the end product that they're using. Um, they are, and much like other product development organizations, are using 3D printing, 
virtual reality in order to do uh, more effective uh, prototyping um, designs as well. So what are the key uh, challenges, learnings, and takeaway in that circumstance? I think this first point is uh, pretty poignant. So Mercedes is moving away from a traditional car maker and positioning itself as a data-driven technology company. I want you to think about that. So they're not just a car maker, they're a data-driven technology company. And I would argue a lot of organizations have to be able to move this, right? If they're gonna produce smarter products and services for their customer, that they're gonna demand, by the way, our customers are gonna demand that, they have to be data-driven in terms of um, the decisions basically that they made. Um, so the technologies are Im implemented all the way from design prototyping to production and then the sale and the service of those vehicles. Um, at the end of the day, it's gonna result in an auto production line that's gonna be safer, faster, more efficient, and able to collect and analyze data um, essentially at every step um, along the way. A couple more slides here. So what is UWM doing about this um, circumstance? So two years ago, uh, going on three years ago, Northwestern Mutual Life had a tech summit um, and they talked about a lot of emerging technologies. They bought in large organizations, they bought in small organizations, they bought in startups um, related to artificial intelligence, related to blockchain, related to IoT, related to cyber security. So in my school, the School of Information Studies, we created what is called the Disruptive Technologies Lab um, in order to be able to meet the demands of our uh, industry partners. And what's cool about that is just a little blurb about the technology. We have a physical space on campus. We're getting a new physical space as well. It's not as large as and nice as the um, connected systems lab, but I really describe this lab more as a platform, a platform where we can collaborate on artificial intelligence, blockchain, IoT, cybersecurity. And the goal is really to do things like this, to run seminars and workshops and boot camps, hackathons. Uh, we have on-site facilities, we have virtual labs, I have a 600 level artificial intelligence class that I've created in order to meet the needs of our industry partners. And the most important thing is that uh, we're a collaborator. We're collaborated with the, uh, the CSI Institute, we're a collaborator with the new Lubarb Center of Entrepreneurship. I host some of my classes out of that. So it's an ability to reach across campus and work with different disciplines from engineering to business, uh, to architecture, to the Peck School of Arts, because they all bring different skill sets, um, and then do you know projects and seminars and collaborate, um, basically related to this area. I mean, again, I think we're analogous to the mobile and the social media platforms and the web. There's going to be a slew of amazing businesses and organizations that are going to be built out of this, and it's going to make our um, lives uh, much better. So I'm excited to to work in this particular area. So I think that's my spiel. Um, the last one, again, I would thank you so much for your, your time and um, logging in uh, today in order to be able to view this. Um, and then I will ask uh, Charles or Mary if there are any questions in the queue. Thank you, Matt. I just want to point out here for the audience that this is, a, a I think Matt set it up really well. The Data Sciences Institute has all the power and, and knowledge about how machine learning can turn data into information, collaborating with them and turning that attention to manufacturing lets CSI members and, and, and uh, team collaborate together in order to turn that energy towards the, the focus of manufacturing. So this is the big benefit of working with these groups of institutes here at, at UWM. So. Thank you, Matt. That, um, that's a good point. I completely forgot to mention the um, Data Science Center, the collaboration that we have with Marquette. All right, well, let's jump right into questions. We have a few. So the first is, can you highlight the specific areas that AR are helping with this JIT type application? Some of this technology can often be confused with older automation tech that has been enabling customization plus JTI at companies like Jaguar, Land Rover, pre-AI. Uh, say that one more time, Charles, that was a mouthful. <laughs> can you highlight the specific areas that uh, artificial intelligence are helping with this, and the acronym is JIT type okay. application. Some of this technology can often be confused with older automation tech that has been enabling customization 
Plus, and I think they meant JIT instead of JTI, at companies like Jaguar, Land Rover, Pre Artificial Intelligence. Um, I, I think the benefit is going to come in, uh, and what I'm assuming is they're asking about just in time manufacturing. Okay, um, so JT. Or just in time inventory. You know, it's, it's two sides of basically one coin. You're trying to limit whether it's at your main facility or it's at a tier one or tier five supplier, all the inventory that you're sitting on. What's interesting right now is, so I'll go back to the slide that I talked about, um, big data. And again, we're trying to extract knowledge um, from the data that we have. So in the past, uh, you can use statistical methods and you'd sit on the data science side to say, okay, we need in order to run lean and efficient in our factory to run seven days of inventory. But if you take that data and maybe you take it over a year or you take it over and then you're running some of these um, AI algorithms, you can deem that you know, really you can survive with three days of in inventory or whatever the particular, you know, circumstance is. So uh, what I would envision happening on factory floors is that, um, and through the CSI Institute and through some of the research that we're doing, and I know I, I specifically on the engineering side, a lot of this is being done, is that you're, you're monitoring these streams of data, you're putting it through your algorithms, and then you're identifying, you know, clusters, clusters of, we don't really need uh, four days of crankshafts. We only need two days of crankshafts. And as a consequence, you're going to get smarter about the inventory levels that you have inside of your factory. I, I'm assuming that's what they're asking in that circumstance. So you're going from, maybe I could say analogous to an analog um, circumstance where you're monitoring those and you know how many days of inventory you have on the hand to a digital world where you're making smart decisions um, based off of um, and extracting knowledge out of the uh, the data that you have. All right. Uh, next question: How does an engineer already working in manufacturing help their company to use artificial intelligence? Um, I think uh, probably the the first uh, step that I would start is um, there's a slew of online resources, uh, and maybe in the in the comments uh, when we post this, we can provide it. Um, start to educate yourself about you know what are some of the what are some of the algorithms, what are some of the things that are um, happening in the circumstance. I believe, and at, honestly, maybe Mary can chime in here, that we are working on credentialing, not only for a data science master's degree across campus, but that will be truly a collaborative um, activity. So I know this is a question that I get from interacting with a lot of our um, strategic partners. Essentially, how do we do upskilling? Um, so I think we are working on, we have a master's degree in my school with a data science track. Um, but I think we are looking at providing micro credentialing, uh, providing more webinars like this that are probably not as, um, you know, survey level, but more in depth things. And I think we're looking for, you know, ways to interact with our strategic partners so that we can fulfill one of our mandates, which is to educate our, educate the community. I don't know if Mary has any um, thoughts on that one. Sure, I can expand on that, Matt. Thank you. <clears throat> the whole idea of CSI is to provide that the, that gap, the, the knowledge, fill that knowledge gap between where academia leaves off and the art of manufacturing picks up. So for the data science degrees, for, for example, Matt, what we're looking at is how to credential those degrees for domain specific capabilities. So while you understand the basic mechanics of AI and how to build an algorithm, uh, a manufacturing conversation will dwell a bit on context. You know, what's the context of that asset? What environment is it operating in? What kind of a product is it making right now? Uh, what's its history of work, right? These are all the all variables that get cranked into these weighted models that you've described. Uh, and those are the things that we'll seek to teach uh, with CSI. And, and anyone who heard um, my talk last week, you can't divorce the topic of reliability from the topic of AI because they are correlated. You have to learn the science of both and work uh, collaboratively with a lot of different knowledge brokers to, to come up with the model that works for you. 
So I hopefully that addresses your question. But I, I actually have have another question, Matt, um, if, if you don't mind, you know, in, in sure. light of all that complexity, right? N trying to understand the weighting of, of different variables that you're pulling into this um, calculation to assess whether it's a good condition or a bad condition. You, know, you gave some examples of um, quality, right? Is the bolt there or not? Um, does the pizza look does Domino's pizza look the way it's supposed to? Uh, do you have an opinion? You know, some some manufacturers are trying to 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 tune those AI models from the bottom up. In other words, um, this is bad, this is good. Other manufacturers take a different approach where they just simply look for anomalies. Um, so this this is a good picture. Anything different from this is a question. Do you have an opinion on the success of one methodology versus another or where, how you would decide on, on which teaching methodology to use? Um, I, I think I think you have you have to start from somewhere and, and maybe that is just determining um, is this good or is this bad? And then as you grow your expertise, as you grow your organization, Again, you're, you're collecting a lot of information and then you're trying to deem some knowledge out of that. Um, I haven't seen, I think if you take a look at the, the circumstance with uh, uh, Daimler or with Volvo or with you know, any of the manufacturing uh, use cases, organizations are struggling with this. I mean, that's why I started with um, you know, the Wall Street Journal or the Forbes article to say, you know, every, everybody's racing to try and implement these things in and we're still early on, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't feel like um, one size fits all for organizations, um, but you have to start somewhere and you start small with a project, you run your data, you get some success under your belt, and then you build it um, from there. I'm, I'm not quite sure if that answers your question, but um, I, haven't, I haven't seen, I don't think one formula is a success for all organizations. I don't know if that makes sense or not. Yeah. Actually, this is related to a question I'm seeing come in here. Charles, you might have been tuning in on this one. Um, are there specific um, resources or platforms that you recommend for, for data mining and analytics? So it's a, I almost think those are kind of two questions, right? Because data mining and, and cleaning and, and contextualizing data is almost a, a whole topic on its own. But do you have any advice for, for that listener? Um, boy, I, I guess I would I would take a look at you know what kind of shop um, you have right now. I can tell you from my experience over the last couple months, um, and I am not one platform or one tech company agnostic, um, but it, it makes, we do a lot of work with Microsoft because we're a Microsoft shop. And I can tell you from working with a couple AI MVPs um, that they're throwing a lot of resources at this. So is Amazon, so is Google, so um, I think it's like evaluating any um, industrial software package. You have to take a look at, you know, what kind of shop you are right now and is it appropriate to implement uh, tools? I I'm telling you right now, Mic Microsoft is working previously behind the scenes so that you don't have to be the algorithm expert. You have to be an expert in your business model. And Google is doing the same thing and um, Amazon is doing the same thing. And I would recommend like any project, if you're going to spend a significant amount of money doing, um, you know, due diligence in that area. And then there's a whole slew of other open source. You know, there's R and there's Python and um, it really depends on what kind of shop you are and, and where you are. And I'll give you an interesting example um, is that uh, one of the reasons why a little tangent here is we're slow to um, get some of these stimulus checks coming out is because some of that um, those applications were written in Cobalt. So if you have an old organization that has a mainframe, maybe implementing a new Microsoft solution won't work. So you have to take a look at what you have, you know, and, and maybe you have to, maybe you're tied to that legacy system for a long time. Um, I would, you know, probably recommend taking a look at where you are and, you know, what makes sense in order to be able to, to implement it. There's a lot of fantastic solutions. You got to do some due diligence though. All right, we have a great question here uh, from a manu from a manufacturing perspective as customer demand becomes personalized with smaller batch sizes and custom delivery. Do you see the emergence of autonomous manufacturing cells that can be deployed closer to the source of demand? 
not necessarily large manufacturing, but apply to small and medium manufacturing? Um, I have not I have not personally seen anything of that. Um, if that makes business sense, uh, I certainly think you can do that. Um, we seem to have uh, a pretty efficient logistics system. I know that Amazon uh, can be challenging to work with sometimes in terms of being able to deliver products and services, but um, I would think, at least from my past experience, having a factory and having that expertise and even that tribal knowledge would maybe be more um, important than a location. We can still ship pretty effectively. In fact, one of the benefits that we're going to get there are trials of um, self-driving autonomous trucks right now. So I would think it would be easier to have a base of expertise, a facility that you're comfortable with, and then being able to um, distribute literally globally. That would be my guess. I'm not a um, you know custom manufacturing expert. All right, an ethics question on uh, AI and machine learning. Uh, considering the research done on gender and ethnic bias in algorithms and code, how is the artificial intelligence uh, machine learning sector working to avoid embedding biases in the system? Uh, this is an exceptional question. So I spent an entire class period on um, uh, talking specifically about this. So this is analogous to talking about, you know, when you write a program, um, garbage in is equal to garbage out. There have been many classic use cases, especially related to some of the, the larger tech companies um, about bias in some of their algorithms. And the problem that they had is the algorithm wasn't flawed. It was the data essentially that they were um, feeding into that. So I think the answer to that, in fact, I will give UWM a ton of credit because through the Lubarge Center of Entrepreneurship, um, they had a pop-up session and they brought in an ethics expert um, related to this talking about some of these biases. And what's going to, I think, in my opinion, be required is, is that it's not only a technical decision and a management decision, but there has to be a social science um, aspect to it. There needs to be somebody in the organization to say, um, you know, is our data, and again, at the, at the base level, if we're uh, teaching these algorithms from experiences or from data, um, is it reflective of what truly is the values of our organization, including a diverse workforce and a diverse customer base? So uh, you need not only data scientists, but you need social scientists who are asking those important questions because you might be, um, you know, disenfranchising um, a lot of your um, a lot of your customers because of that. All right. Uh, let, let me let me expand on that answer a little bit, um, commenting on uh, on bias in data sets specific to manufacturing, because I, I almost think this this question is you have there's a social aspect of it, but then there's the pure da data science aspect of it as well. And, and this goes back. It, this is sort of related to the question that I had earlier for you, Matt, about teaching models, right? Uh, if if you're if you are starting your machine learning journey from a, a completely unknown space of, of what indicators tend to lead to bad, then you're reliant on a data sample set, which is widely arrayed and um, with a careful viewpoint on any bias that might be in that data set to begin with. If you're starting your teaching model from a, this is always, this is, this looks good, all the time, then you're someone eliminating that risk because you're focusing only what's good. But again, to your point, Matt, that only works um, in instances where it's appropriate for your particular application. So you really have to think about where you're applying that. But I just wanted to call that out as one of a piece of decision criteria that anyone listening here on the phone needs to consider when you're when you're putting in place AI based projects. All right. Well, uh, that's all the time we have for today. Thank you, Matt, and all our listeners for your great questions and active participation. Uh, we'll be posting shortly the recording from today's session on the CSI website events page. Uh, you can access it there hopefully today by tomorrow at the latest. Uh,
I will invite you to tune in next week on April 30th when we'll hear from Kevin Clark, VP from Fluke Reliability. He joined Fluke in 2016 and has 30 plus years of industrial experience working with both Fortune 500 and smaller startup manufacturing and technology companies serving in various leadership capacities. Kevin will discuss that as machines become more complex, decisions about where to apply monitoring, monitoring technologies become more complex as well. How have measuring devices such as vibration sensors become digitalized? What is the future of digitalization for all types of measuring devices? How do you determine which data is important to store or not? Please register for this event at uwm.edu slash CSI slash events. You can also register for events through our uh, Connected Systems Institute LinkedIn page, which you can see right here on the screen. Uh, go look for events and it'll take you right to our registration site on Eventbrite. Uh, my name is Charles Mosley, your host, signing off for today. Thanks for attending, everyone. Thanks for your questions. Thank you, everyone.